Hi guys, welcome back to Introduction to Rust. My name is Tensor. Today we're going to be talking about smart pointers. We're also going to be talking about closures, higher order functions, and iterators. So we've talked about references quite a bit inside of this tutorial, though we haven't really talked directly about pointers. A pointer is a variable that contains a address in memory rather than an actual value. So in essence, it points at some other data hence the name pointer. Smart pointers, on the other hand, are data structures that act like a pointer, but they have additional metadata. Now, the smart pointer that we're really going to look at is the box smart pointer, which is the most straightforward smart pointer and probably the most useful one that we use inside of Rust. This allows us to allocate a piece of data to the heap. Every primitive in Rust is automatically allocated to the stack. If we wrap it in a box, it will be allocated to the heap. So we can create a box just by calling the box namespace and then the method new. Then we put the value that we want to put inside of it. In this case, we're just putting a value of 10 in there. And then we can print it out with a println statement. You'll see here that this will just print out 10 rather than box 10. And there we go, it says b equals 10. So probably the best example that we can use for uh, explaining the box type is to implement what's called a cons list. Now, a cons list is a data structure that comes from the Lisp programming language and all of its dialects, of course. In Lisp, there's a function called cons, which is short for construct, which we can use to call to create a new list. What this cons list is, is just a recursive call on the cons operator over and over and over again until it creates a list. So we can sort of model this behavior by creating an enum called list. And then inside of it, we have this con structure, which has an I32, and then recursively refers to the list enum again. And then the other uh, type that we have in here is this end uh, type. Now you can see that we're getting an error here, and it's saying recursive type list has an infinite size. What's essentially happening is the compiler is trying to store this enum on the stack. We just use the box type here instead and now we're saying okay well store this on the heap for us you can see that the error gets cleaned up so to actually implement our list here we can then just uh well make things easier on ourselves by bringing these in so that we can call them directly the cons in the end uh, type instead of having to write list uh, colon colon cons and then we can just say let l equal cons one and then inside of it we'll have box new then we call cons on two box new cons on three and box new and then finally we have our end and this will create our list for us so we can use a very simple example to show that box sort of works like reference does you can see here we're creating a y we're setting it equal to four and then we're saying x equals a reference to y then we're saying z equals a box of x then we're saying if the pointer of x is equal to the pointer of z then print out true and as predicted you can see here we get true so this box smart pointer thing might not seem very useful right now but it becomes a lot more useful when we actually start to look at uh, closures and look at passing around closures and things like that so closures are anonymous functions you can save in a variable and passes arguments to other functions and you can even have a function that creates a closure so normally in rust when we write a new function we use the fn macro and we use the name of the function then we put in the argument with the type declaration then the return type if there is one and then we have the function body inside of these brackets here we can create an anonymous function just by simply using this format we use the pipe operators instead of parentheses we don't need to put in the type here also we're setting it equal to the variable f so technically this function doesn't have a name now you see here that there's a slight error that's just saying that type annotations are needed but that's not actually the case if we wanted to we could put type annotations in here so i could say i32 and then have this say it returns i32 if we say create a new value here say 10 and then we call f of x so to actually run the function we just add these parentheses and then we put the argument that we want to run it on in this case 10 this would give us back 11. we can also create closures that take no values uh, rather than putting a uh, value inside of it we just use these two pipes and then for the in this case this is just running a println statement then to run p in this case we just type in p with two parentheses like this 
we get our 11 from before and then we get this is a closure. Now closures are inherently flexible and will do what the functionality requires to make the closure work without annotation. This allows capturing to flexibly adapt to the use case, sometimes moving and sometimes borrowing. Closure can capture variables and there are various different ways that they can do so. They have a preference to capture variables by reference rather, which makes it a little bit easier for us when we're working in Rust. All right, so take a look at this example. We've created a C value, which is mutable, and we set it equal to zero. Then we create a closure here. This closure takes in no value. It just takes C, increments it by one, and then prints out the uh, result. As you see here, incremented by one, incremented by one, incremented by one, and this goes one, two, three. So this is the value of C here. So this is interesting because C is scoped to the main function like this. And essentially this uh, function is borrowing C from the outer scope. All right, so take a look at this example. We've got two closures. We've got the first one, a P closure. It takes in nothing and then it just prints out a little string. And then we've got our X closure, which takes in an I32 and then multiplies that by 10. Then we've got two main functions, run and add three. Run has a generic, add three also has a generic. And then we say that the argument is of type generic. For add three, we're returning an I32. For run, we're returning nothing. And then we're just saying that generic must be a function by using this fn trait here. And in this case, for add three, we're saying that it must be a function that takes in an I32 and returns an I32. Both of these functions are then executing the functions inside of them. What will happen is when we run run on p, it will just call this print statement. And then when we run uh, add three on X, it will then put three in for I and then multiply by 10. We get hello from the run function and three times 10 equals 30. We can also use closures inside of structs. So for instance, if I create a struct called A and give it a field, uh, say F, and we'll give this a type of F. So we'll use a generic here. We have to say f implements the fn trait, and then we'll just say that this is a function that takes an i32 and returns an i32. Now we can then instantiate a with uh, x inside of it. So we can say let a equal a, and then we'll say f equals x. And this will allow us to store our X closure inside of this struct here. And we can use these closures or functions in general anywhere that we use other types of values as well, as long as we implement the fn trait inside of whatever it is that we're embedding the function in. You don't even need to use a closure inside of a function. For instance, if we want to just use a normal function inside of this run function, we can do that. So let's take a look at that. So you can see here as before, we have our p closure. But now we have this PR function, which also prints something out. And now we're just running our run uh, function here on PR, and this will run it like it's running P. And here you go. So we get hello from the run function, and this is a normal function. We can also use closures as output parameters. However, there's sort of a slight catch to doing this inside of Rust. Now, the main reason why this is problematic is because Rust currently only supports returning concrete non-generic types. Anonymous closure types by definition are unknown. Therefore, returning a closure is only possible by making it concrete. So we can do this by using our smart pointer, which is the box. All right, so take a look at this example. We have a function called create, and this will return a box within a function inside of it. And then we can just call box new. Now we have this weird keyword here called move. And this is essentially just saying that all of the values inside of this closure must be referenced by value rather than by reference. If the values were to be passed back from the closure itself, they would automatically be dropped as soon as the function exits. As soon as we exit this create function, all the values that are created inside of the create function would essentially die from the scope and they wouldn't be passed back to the main function scope. So by using this move keyword, we are preventing that from happening. We say let x equal create. So we run the create function, which then creates this closure here. And then we can then run that closure by running X. And you can see here, we just get this line printed back. This is a closure in a box. So closures are especially useful when we get to iterators. So 
Here you can see that we're creating a vector of 1, 2, and 3. And then we have this print statement here. And we use v, and then we call a method iter on it, which turns it into an iterator. And then we are going to uh, actually preface the iterator by passing in this closure here into this any uh, method. And essentially what this is doing is it's checking each and every element inside of the uh, iterator and then trying to see if it's not equal to 2. So you can see here it comes back as v true because we have two elements inside of this vector that are not equal to 2, even though we have one that is equal to 2. So iterators are a pattern that you use to do some task over a sequence of items. All right, so here's what the iterator trait looks like in Rust. You can see here that we have this associated type called item. Now this item is just the type of the actual collection that we're trying to iterate through. For instance, this vector would be a vector of i32s, then item would then be equal to i32. What essentially happens when we iterate through this vector, uh, for instance, if we call uh, v.iter, is it will essentially call next until there isn't another uh, element in the vector. And the next will essentially just iterate through this one element at a time. Now we can directly call the method next on our iterator, and this will just allow us to go from one item to the next in a controlled way. So another thing to note is that the actual iterator itself is mutatable. So this is very important, especially when we actually get into concurrency. When we have multiple threads dealing with multiple uh, collections of data, and we have to iterate over these different pieces of data, using iterators is very useful because it allows us to isolate the data from the actual iterator part. All right, let's take a look at this example. So we have this is even function. So if we get an even number, it will return true. And then our main function, we have a top variable. We're setting this equal to 10,000. Then we have a variable called C, which is set to zero, but it's mutable. And then we're going to iterate from zero all the way to infinity. So we don't actually specify where to stop here in the iterator that we're creating here. Then we're going to say let x equal n times n. If x is greater than 10,000, then we want to break out of the loop. Otherwise, we want to run the is even on whatever x is. And if it comes back as true, so we're going to find the sum of all of the squared even numbers under 10,000. This is the imperative way of doing things. Rust iterators are what are called lazy iterators. And that means that we can call something like this where it goes to infinity and it will not break the actual program. So in a lot of other languages, if you tried to have an infinite loop, you would actually end up breaking your program. In essence, what lazy means is that the actual compiler will not resolve things until it needs to. So because we're breaking at 10,000, it won't go past 10,000. And you can see here we get our answer, which is 161,700. Now we can write this in a much more functional way as well using closures and using some of the methods that come with Rust. So first we need to create our iterator. So we're going from zero to infinity. Then we want to use the map method, which is a part of the iterator method, and this will allow us to map a function, or a closure in this case, onto our iterator. Next, we want to use the take while method. Now, this allows us to set a bound here, so we're saying that n is going to be less than 10,000. So this will make sure that we don't go above 10,000. And then we want to filter through all of the values that we've mapped and taken here. We're going to filter using this function here, our isEven function. And finally, we want to call the fold method, which will allow us to run this closure and then sum all of the values together. Now this right here is equivalent to what we had before, except now we're using higher order functions, we're using closures, and this is more of a functional paradigm. And if I run it here, you see that we got the same answers we got above. Anyway guys, if you enjoyed this tutorial, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment in the comment box below. And if you disliked it, then downvote it as much as you'd like. Have a good night.